quick and uh, are recharged for this session. We have another wonderful lineup of talks in this session. I'm very excited to listen to all of them. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, this is our mini symposium on passive acoustic monitoring. Please post all your questions on Discord. We will read them out as soon as uh, a talk is completed. For the first session, we have Dr. Pooja Choksi, who recently completed her PhD from Columbia University. She'll be talking to us on listening for change, using acoustics to quantify the impact of ecological restoration on soundscapes of a tropical dry forest. Pooja is unavailable to take questions right after the talk, so please do leave all your questions for her on Discord. Thank you so much for having me here um, to talk about my work on um, quantifying the impact of restoration um, using acoustics. Um, this is some of my work that I've done in Central India along with um, uh, a few co-authors. Um, so we're all aware of the large impetus for nature-based solutions in this UN decade of restoration. The really ambitious targets, for example, India has pledged to restore 26 million hectares of degraded land by 2030. And the primary focus of this, the primary objective of this restoration is, of course, carbon sequestration, but also biodiversity conservation. And if we're going to be putting in so much time and energy and funding, um, we need to know whether our efforts are producing the biodiversity conservation results that we planned to achieve. And there has been, over the last few years, there's been a lot of work that has happened on quantifying the impact of restoration on fauna and flora. For example, this meta-analysis finds that restored systems are closer to the reference sites uh, denoted by this line, dotted line, um, than degraded systems. Uh, what I want to draw your attention to is the N over here. These are the number of single species or multiple species papers they used, um, the authors used for each taxonomic group to be able to come up with this result. And while this is really important to study single species, um, is it possible to use tools and technology to, multi to monitor multiple taxa in a less time intensive way? Um, the reason a lot of people in the restoration community are asking this question is because um, tools and technology will give us spatial um, coverage as opposed to more human intensive surveys. And that really got me interested in acoustics um, and the application of acoustics to ask, to answer questions related to restoration. Uh, I asked these questions in Mandla district in the center of India, that little red star, uh, outside of Kanha National Park. Uh, the forest is um, deciduous and a lot of people depend on the forest for their livelihoods. The question I asked is essentially, how does ecological restoration impact bird communities and soundscapes of a tropical dry forest? And before I take you into the results, I'm going to show you a couple of photographs of these sites. The first is an unrestored site where, as you can see in the understory, there's a very high density of lantana camera, which a lot of local people find quite inconvenient. Uh, they find it's a hindrance to their livelihoods. And so local people in facilitated by um, an NGO called Foundation for Ecological Security, and of course, with the support of the local forest department, restored their sites uh, by removing lantana for three consecutive years and allowing the forest to regenerate thereafter. So this is what the restored sites look like. And instead of using a reference site from a protected area, which would have been Tanha, uh, I used reference sites from um, low lantana density sites that people told me were uh, sort of quote unquote healthy forest. So their perception of a healthy habitat was where was one where lantana didn't really persist. And those are the reference sites I used in this study. To make sure that my sites were statistically comparable, uh, I used population census variables, vegetation composition and structure, like large tree density, um, the, the diversity of the overstory, um, the, the tree density um, as certain variables to match these sites, as well as geographical variables like percentage of farmland in a three kilometer radius, percentage of forest in a three kilometer radius, um, to ensure that all our sites were statistically comparable. And what we were getting at was really just the effect of um, the, the, the changes in the understory, the treatment, which was removal of lantana. 
And so um, acoustic data that we collected over two years uh, can be visualized like this, where times on the x-axis, frequencies on the y-axis. We collected data from zero to 24,000 hertz uh, and over a 24 hour time period over two months, uh, two years, sorry. And my analysis is split into two parts. The first is the lower frequencies, which is two to 8,000 hertz that is dominated by birds and insects. And then the higher frequencies from nine to 24,000 hertz, which is dominated by insects and say bats. Um, and now I'm going to take you first to the to the lower frequency range, um, the, the, the results from the lower frequency range. When we manually listen to the data, approximately 100 hours of the data, uh, we, we sort of noted all of the bird species that we found. Uh, and we found that there was no significant differences in the cumulative number of bird species detected when we look at all the birds together. Uh, here you've got lowland antenna density first, restored, and then unrestored sites. When we split up this group of birds into their habitat specialization, we found that unrestored sites had a higher number of generalists than restored sites. And when we looked at the forest and woodland affiliated sites, once again, we found no significant differences in the cumulative number of um, specialists that we detected. This um, habitat specialization uh, was taken from the status of India's birds, a state of India's birds um, that came out a couple of years ago. Um, that's how we, we sort of broke them into two groups. So while we see that there are not large differences when we look at just the number of birds we detected, uh, we do see a small difference in the bird community. What we're seeing here in this NMDS plot are the this different circles are the different acoustic recorders across restored, unrestored, and LLD sites. Uh, and you, as you can see, the restored and LLD sites are set up and closer together, and the unrestored sites um, practically cover 99% of these, um, or almost 100% of the NLD sites um, of, of all of the, the, the other two types of um, restored and NLD sites, uh, but they're sort of wider in, in terms of the species that they have, the species community they have. Um, the four letter, the four letter sort of codes here are the eBird codes for the different um, birds that we encountered um, in our data. Uh, and so we see that there are small differences in their approach and significance. I'm now going to switch gears and go to the soundscape analysis that we did. Uh, what you have here is time on the x-axis and uh, a sort of variable that we used um, to, to look at our data, which is acoustic space U. Uh, it is essentially the percentage of time that um, our frequency range between two to 8,000 hertz was active. So some species were calling between two to 8,000 hertz. And what you'll immediately see is that these sites are not very different from each other. And we see that in our statistical models as well. When we control for all of the variables on which we match, we found that restoration is positively but not significantly associated with the acoustic space use. When we look at the higher frequencies, that's between nine to 24,000 hertz, we used um, a metric called acoustic space occupancy. And what that means is that it is a percentage of um, frequency bins that had species calling between nine to 24,000 hertz. So not every frequency bin was occupied by uh, Earth species. Uh, and so we looked at the percentage of, sort of frequency bins that were active in these higher frequencies. Uh, and once again, we've, we've shown it over a 24-hour period. And again, you can see that these sites are not very different from each other. However, restored and low lantana density sites are significantly negatively associated with acoustic space occupancy. So that means that acoustic space occupancy is generally lower in the higher frequencies. And in our previous result, we found that um, restoration had had um, generally higher acoustic space depth. And so what could be explaining these, these results? What we find, uh, what I think could be happening here is that the overstory matters more than the understory. And what I mean by that is that the treatment, which was antenna removal, really just happened in the understory. And the overstory is where um, all of these forests were pretty much alike. 
uh, we found, but even the small differences between these sites um, was significantly associated with the response, either acoustic space use or acoustic space occupancy. Um, and so that could be one of the reasons by seeing the kind of um, results we're seeing. Um, the second is we, we measured these sites just three years post the first restoration effort um, and it, we really need to wait because tropical dry forests grow slowly. So we need to keep going back to understand whether we'll see any changes um, in the coming years. Um, I'm largely thinking about the low frequency range where we didn't really find any significant associations or changes um, in, in, in the acoustic space. Scene. Um, so perhaps if we, you know, we, we sort of kept monitoring these sites, we might see a difference, um, though we can't be certain we will. And large, lastly, when I think about the higher frequency range, uh, where we had um, lower acoustic space occupancy in the restored and lowland antenna density sites, uh, one of the reasons we could be seeing that is because of a more abundant or diverse predatory community, especially an insectivorous predatory community, because we think that the, the higher frequencies, the higher frequency range is largely driven by insects. Um, and Another reason uh, I think we could be seeing these results, especially in the higher frequencies, is because lantana is, is so dense in the understory um, and, and higher frequencies tend to scatter a lot more. Um, and so that might be um, driving the result where understored sites has, have an, a higher acoustic space occupancy. Of course, these were all a space for time experiment and not uh, based on a before and after. Um, so at this point, this is speculation, but uh, I definitely wanted to share, you know, some of our thoughts about these results. You can read a lot more about this work in, especially to do with the lower frequencies um, in this paper that we recently published and it was a huge team that worked on it. Um, it could not have happened without a big team um, in restoration ecology. So I encourage you to go read these results. Um, and to end, I wanna go back to the question I posed earlier or rather the thought I, I introduced this work with is that can we use acoustics to monitor restoration? You know, you've got a restored site and this unrestored site. Um, and, and the answer is we're gonna to have to keep using this tool in different sites to really understand its relationship with um, the ground truth data. So we've got to understand, um, you know, species densities, uh, abundances, uh, understand diversity and, and how it all relates to some of these acoustic um, metrics that we're using. Um, and so that just means that we've got to go back and keep getting more data, trying to understand this relationship better. Also, a lot of the work I showed you was the first half of what we've done, which is understanding just what are the differences. Um, the second half of uh, my work is largely focused on who is driving these soundscapes? So why are we seeing the kind of results we're seeing? Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done, and and I'm still hopeful about technology for for monitoring restoration progress. And lastly, this work has some implications. Um, I've taken these results back to the NGO Foundation for Ecological Security and community members in sites in the buffer of Kanha National Park where I worked. Um, and it's really interesting to see the ideas of how we can take this forward in the way we do restoration in other places. Um, so a lot of application of this work in the immediate future. Um, I want to thank my co-authors, uh, you know, for helping me put together this 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 work. Also, thank you to the MP Forest Department for giving the necessary permits, uh, FES members, uh, local communities. Couldn't have done this without all of them. And with that, thank you so much for listening. Um, I'm really excited to hear your thoughts and comments about this work um, and any questions that you may have. Thanks again, Pooja, for a wonderful talk. Uh, I can attest that uh, this has taken an immense amount of effort to put all of this together. And Pooja, unfortunately, cannot be here today because she's actually in the field collecting a lot more acoustic data. So please leave your questions for Pooja on Discord. We'll now uh, move on to the next speaker. The next speaker for the session is Chitti Arvind. Chitti is a PhD student at Isa Tirupati. And today she'll be talking to us about creating an automated recorder detection framework 
for the critically endangered Jordan's cursor. Hi everybody, my name is Chiti Arvind and I am from Aisat Tirupati. Today I'll be talking to you about a study that we uh, create in which we created a detection framework using automated recording units to detect the critically endangered Jordan's Cosa. So why really should we be using bioacoustics? Uh, monitoring techniques are essential in the conservation of any species and in the in the case of birds, point counts were a really popular option. However, with the advent of upcoming technology, bioacoustics is proving to be an excellent tool in biodiversity conservation. And there have also been several comparative studies that sh show uh, using especially passive acoustic monitoring might fare as a better tool. Birds are also a highly vocal species having characteristic acoustic signatures, which makes them ideal to be monitored using bioacoustic technology. And a few advantages of using uh, automated recording units or passive acoustic monitoring is that it can cover a large area. These units are programmable. The data can be stored and revisited for later. And there is also not much uh, human interference and observer bias when collecting the data. Uh, there have also been several studies uh, previously that have used uh, automated recording units to study nocturnal birds that are difficult to spot also monitor uh, birds with infrequent calls and as well as endangered birds. So a little bit of background to the Jordan's Cosa. Uh, it is a critically endangered bird listed by the IUCN Red List. Uh, it is also listed as a Schedule 1 species under the Wildlife Protection Act. Um, this bird is found restricted to a tiny pocket of scrubland in Andhra Pradesh near Kadapa and this area is known as the Sri Lanka Malayshwara Wildlife Sanctuary. The last confirmed sighting for this bird was in 2008. So in the past there have been a couple of detection methods used for this particular species. One of them involved laying out sand tracking strips and subsequently footprints were identified and matched to that of the Jordan's Cosa for identification. And the other one was by setting up camera traps, which is basically clearing an area and setting up two uh, camera traps um, facing each other. And when uh, a bird uh, uh, triggers a camera trap, you get an image uh, such as seen out here, which is of the Jordan's causes captured via a camera trap. Now these uh, techniques um, were useful. Uh, in detecting the bird, but they are not very, uh, they were not very efficient and a long term solution for monitoring as uh, they are labor intensive as well as the coverage is very uh, small, right? So, uh, we thought of using acoustic technology to create a detection framework to monitor this bird. And the Jordan Sposer's call is also very unique and it serves as its acoustic signature. So, that brings us to the objectives of our study. Uh, which was uh, first to create a reproducible detection framework for monitoring the Jordan's Cosa and uh, secondly to create a call detection framework using commercially available uh, software uh, to actually detect the species and uh, help in the screening of, collect, uh, of uh, a large amount of data collected. So in the first step for the field protocol uh, this is divided into two steps. The first is to determine grid sizes using an attenuation experiment and the second is actually programming the recorders and deploying them at the field site. So uh, for this attenuation experiment, actually what is an attenuation experiment? We perform an experiment to basically see what is the recording radius of every recorder and we can determine as to how far recorders can be placed from each other in a landscape. So to determine the recording radius, uh, what we did was to uh, uh, lay out all our recorders at a fixed location and carry out playbacks of the Jordan's Cosa's call from a particular speaker that had been calibrated to produce calls of this word at a particular volume. So we did this uh, attenuation experiment at different distances from the recorders ranging from 100 meters to 700 meters. And we used four kinds of recorders for this which is a song meter 4 developed by Wildlife Acoustics, uh, Swift Recorders by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, Rugged Swift Recorders also developed by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, uh, and Audio Moths by Open Acoustics. Uh, 
and what we found in our results were that all recorders recorded till 500 meters whereas two recorders recorded till 700 meters so we conservatively set our grid sizes to be one is by one square kilometers so that the recording radius of 500 meters would capture all sounds within that grid cell so this is a representation of uh, an image showing the La Sri Lankapaleshwara Wildlife Sanctuary habitat which is an open scrubland and uh, for our field protocol we gridded up the entire foothills of the Sri Lankapaleshwara Wildlife Sanctuary and uh, gridded them with one by one square kilometer grid cells and we deployed a total of 17 recorders in cells that were chosen based on uh, our field visits and feasibility of the uh, location. Uh, a recording schedule of uh, 13 hours was uh, programmed which recorded uh, a nocturnal schedule from 5 p.m. to 6 a.m. and we carried out the recording for about four and a half to five months and we, rec we re revisited this landscape every month for changing batteries in the recorders as well as changing the SD cards. So the summary of uh, the results that we got to compare the four kinds of hardware that we use, we found that the Swift recorders seem to be most uh, useful because they recorded for the longest duration and collected the most amount of data and this is primarily because the uh, Swift rugged recorders can house 12 up to 12 D cell batteries which means that they have a very long run time depending on your programming schedule. Now for the next uh, and also we collected over uh, 24,000 hours of data which is about 8 TB of data. So now that we have collected, we collected so much of data, we needed to create a detection framework to help us, uh, you know, um, uh, to automate, partially automate the process of screening this data. So for creating a detection framework, we first need to create, have a template of the Jordan's Scorzer score that can be used in these detection algorithms. And then we use the template to create a recognizer to screen the collected automated recorder unit data. So to create a template, we need to select good calls of the Jordan Scorzer and this especially applies for one of the softwares that we used. We selected loud calls of the Jordan Scorzer and out here is a, a, the, a spectrogram showing you the call of the Jordan Scorzer which is a disyllabic call and uh, we used only the second harmonic as indicated in the figure out here because this had the strongest signal and not the fundamental which is usually the common case. So uh, to create a recognizer what we used is two kinds of software. One was uh, Raven Pro developed by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and the other is Kaleidoscope Pro developed by Wildlife Acoustics. So now to create our detection framework first we needed to shortlist the birds that are present in the Jordan Scorzer's uh, uh, habitat as well as vocalize in the Jordan Scorzer's calling bandwidth. So for that what we did was we pulled out all the data from eBird uh, of uh, checklists from the Sri Lanka Malayashwara Wildlife Sanctuary. We shortlisted species that call between the Jordan Scorzer's acoustic niche of 1 to 4000 kilohertz. And we further shortlisted species that are co-occurring species in the Jordan Scorzer's habitat based on our field visits. So now to create a recognizer in these two softwares, uh, we uh, changed the number of parameters and once the uh, recognizer was created, we evaluated the performance of this recognizer using a test data set and calculating some performance metrics, namely precision recall and an F beta score. So now when we have the, we created the recognizer that was working at a good uh, optimum, we screened our 8 TB of uh, acoustic data collected in both the different softwares separately. And once we received the detections, we manually checked the detections with the calls of birds that were shortlisted via our uh, eBird pathway. So this uh, resulted in uh, two different categories of identifications. One was a species that we could identify and correlate with co-occurring species or it could potentially be a Jordan Scorzer score. 
but um, the other uh, thing was that uh, we get calls of unknown bird species that we were unable to identify and we sent them to experts in the field of uh, avian acoustics and asked them to rate this particular call as to be more likely or less likely to belong to the jordan scosa then we also performed a spectral cross correlation with the call of the jordan scosa so the results of the performance metrics using these particular software we found that raven pro uh, fared much better than kaleidoscope pro showing us a higher precision recall and f beta score and um, also out here i must state that this f beta score is calculated uh, via the harmonic mean of precision and recall but here the value of beta is set to 2 because we want to favor a uh, recall over precision because we do not want to miss a, a single a uh, call of the student's course so in this case a uh, recall holds a higher uh, value than precision so we had several species detected by our template detector namely the uh, three species of night jar a common hawk cuckoo indian pea fowl grey jungle fowl and also the shikra but we also had this unknown call that we were unable to identify so we did a spectrogram cross correlation of this particular call along with the call of the jordan scoser and what we found was a high spectrogram cross correlation score and uh, then we uh, also checked the context of the call by looking at recording 60 minutes before and after this call and what we found was that it was uh, the mimicry of a bayback shrike collected from a recorder that was um, that it man functioned and collected over day recordings though this cannot confirm or deny the presence of the jordan scosa it does show us the uh, importance of uh, accounting for mimicry during such studies so to summarize the outcomes of our study was that we were able to create a robust detection framework to detect the jordan scosa using automated recorders the recommended field protocol is to use 1 by 1 square kilometer grids and use rugged recorders and also to use raven pro as our software so there are a few limitations to this as well since it has a high initial investment cost of the recorders uh, sometimes recorders can malfunction leading to loss of data and you might have variability in attenuation uh, properties and distances based on the vegetation of the area Uh, so future direction is that our team from Asa Tirupati is expanding and uh, going to set up recorders in three other reserve forests and monitor them using um, automated recording technology. So I would finally like to thank the Wildlife Conservation Trust and Asa Tirupati for uh, um, uh, all the funding, the Andhra Pradesh Forest Department for support, the Nature Conservation Foundation and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology as well. Uh thank you and uh, happy to take questions. Thanks Jyoti for that really cool talk on the Jordan's cursor. It's always fascinating to uh learn how acoustics is being used to monitor a critically endangered species. While we wait for questions to pour on uh Discord, actually we have a question from Prachi. Uh, Prachi asks, is there a recording of the Jordan's cursor call available? Uh, uh yeah. it's there on actually zeno canto there's one call of the jordan scorzer that uh, dr p jagannathan has recorded so that is available on zeno canto okay and and chitty towards the end of the talk you highlighted that uh, the call the unknown call was potentially uh, a mimic call of the bayback strike yeah so uh, going by that logic uh, can we potentially speculate if the jordan scorzer is still present because the species would have to learn this from a source and, yeah so <laughs> yeah it's not like an ac- accurate imitation also of the jordan scorzer's call and also so you need to look at the context of the call and uh, this actually happened from a recorder that man functioned and recorded during the day so uh, the instance of a call just once probably is not sufficient enough for us to confirm or deny the presence of a bird being mimicked even incorrectly but it is something that we should probably uh, keep in mind like looking at mimicry got it okay and i think towards the beginning of the talk you were also mentioning uh, about other approaches used to detect the uh, jordan's curse or the you know these uh, uh, 
foot traps or I probably am missing tracking uh, strips. Yeah. Right, right. These strips. So do you think uh, acoustics are a much better approach than these these strips to detect like a very elusive nocturnal bird like the Jordan's cursor? Um, I I don't think any method might be better than the other, but some are just more efficient. Like in terms of if you need to cover a very large area, probably acoustics is the best for screening like very large landscapes. And if it is a word that is vocal, it probably will be captured in your recording. So acoustics and other... So once you're probably zoned on in some area where there is a potential Jordan's closer, then you can put like tracking strips or camera traps in that area to get actual, maybe better evidence, like a photo or something like that. I see. Okay. Uh, Vrishal asks, what other information are you likely to analyze from the rest of the huge amount of data that you've collected while waiting to detect the Jordan's cursor? Oh, uh, great question. So, I mean, data is, <laughs> data is, it, it can be, it's also, it's a nocturnal scape that we do have, and it can be used to analyze any kind of nocturnal data that you would need to, I mean, if you're interested in for example, some other species that is nocturnal, like owls or something, you might have like a lot of uh, hits in those recordings. Though our detectors were created to fall between one to four uh, thousand kilohertz, it wouldn't probably detect owls. But if you create a detector for that and screen this data, yes, surely you might find some hits. Cool. Thanks, Chitty. And uh, one other question on the natural history of this bird, does it vocalize a lot? Uh, so from previous re uh, previous uh, studies of people who have worked on it extensively, like Dr. P. Jagadnathan and Dr. Bharat Bhushan, uh, they have found them to vocalize during between uh, dusk and dawn. So they did also do some playback experiments. In some instances, they did receive a call back, but in some instances, not. So I don't think, yeah, we could draw any. It's so elusive. Okay. Thanks again, Chitty, uh, for your time and for this amazing work. Uh, next up, we have uh, Antara Kulkarni. Antara is a master's student at ISA Bhopal. Antara will be talking to us about acoustic monitoring of birds across land use patterns in semi-arid ecos ecosystems. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Antara Kulkarni from ISA Bhopal. And uh, today I'll be talking about my MS thesis work which is on the acoustic monitoring of birds across land use patterns in semi-arid ecosystems. Um, right, so first a brief introduction into the background and objectives of my work. So all over the world, we're currently experiencing alarming levels of biodiversity declines. Uh, this is especially concerning because India, being a major biodiversity hotspot, has over 800 vertebrates considered rare and threatened. Um, habitat loss is also on the rise and um, cropland expansion especially has increased by around 50% in the last century. But to expect this, um, you know, agro activities to stop is impractical since the farmland industry contributes around 20.2% to India's total GDP. So in this context, can we somehow develop guidelines for, uh, for um, you know, cropland expansion that is also sustainable? So the objectives of, of the study are one, to use acoustic monitoring to observe the biodiversity for continuously changing habitats, and two, to use measures of species diversity to determine um, community structure in human modified habitats. Right, so my study details. Um, I did this study in uh, Ajmer district over eight villages in an area broadly known as Shoklia over one and a half months from July to August. These uh, are my eight villages, as you can see over here. Uh, and yeah, so we chose Shoklia because of its diverse bird community, which is what we have monitored. Uh, this is because birds are a mobile and are thus easy, uh, are thus widely distributed and easy to identify as well. Uh, they vocalize, which means that we can acoustically monitor them. And most importantly, they, pro they provide a quantifiable reaction to environmental change in the habitat. Uh, so we also chose Shoklia because it's a, a scrubland cropland matrix. Uh, most studies have monitored the change of uh, the the effect of land use change in uh, forests as the base comparison, but there isn't a large body of study on scrublands, and these areas are often encroached into our agriculture, 
or more importantly there are also constantly efforts to uh, regreen these areas in a misguided conservation effort almost so we're trying to figure out um, the ecological value of scrublands uh, to better understand this particular ecosystem right so uh, shoklia scrublands are pretty sparsely vegetated and the plants which are mostly bushy uh, woody and uh, thorny So the main flora over here are uh, capris decidua, which is care uh, English babul, acacia nilotica, which is babul, uh, kajri, uh, bear, which is uh, yeah bear, um, hingotia, and um, the I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, milkweed. So uh, most importantly, however, so what I want to draw your attention to over here is um, the Prosopis juliflora, which is a well-known invasive species and has since spread quite a bit in the, in the uh, scrublands that is often dominant in the vegetation. Cropping happens in two cycles of uh, Kharif and Rabi. And we uh, studied the Kharif season, which is also coincided with the breeding season of the birds. Uh, cropland is mostly just large patches of moong or jawar and occasionally thin. So now a bit about acoustic monitoring. So bioacoustic, as Anand has already uh, explained, is the study of acoustic communication which can happen at a species-specific level or um, a community level. Uh, community vocalization, vocalization are, are also affected by biotic interactions like competition, um, abiotic interactions like uh, perch height or structural properties and uh, the environment, most importantly. Uh, so how does the environment or a change in the environment affect the bird community and can we figure that out acoustically? Right, so this is where passive acoustic comes in. Uh, passive acoustics involves setting up and scheduling recorders to record in an omnidirectional and in an unbiased manner. So you have a, an idea of the acoustics around um, the recorder. And it's great because data collection is lower effort than say walking transects or um, you know surveying the area. And by setting up several recorders in multiple sites, we can have high throughput data collection as well. It is also a non-invasive collection method since the site is undisturbed by human presence. And with tech advancements, uh, the resources and with the recorders becoming cheaper and with lower manpower costs, is also fairly resource efficient. Right, so I, uh, to record my behaving communities, we've used the song meter mini, which I've which you seen in the previous photos as well. It's uh, this one, the one that I'm putting up over here. And we also occasionally used um, Audiomon, which is a Raspberry Pi based uh, recorder. So once these devices were scheduled to record at the appropriate time, they'd be set up on trees or on poles in each habitat to record the bird communities. Right. So I recorded the dawn chorus of birds, since that's the acoustically most active hour. Uh, and it starts half an hour before sunrise and continues for around two hours or so after. And um, so I usually I record from 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. in the mornings, giving me around 36 hours of uh, data for cropland and 32 for scrubland. So this is a basic workflow of the data that I collected and how I uh, um, analyzed it. So we set up um, the song meter mini in uh, different kinds of habitats, so cropland and scrubland for me. And then we identify birds using spectrograms. So spectrograms are um, waveforms of uh, frequency and time. So this is a peacock, for example, and this is an Indian pygmy. And we'd use this data to create a presence and absence matrix. So over here, a one denotes presence of a particular species in the site, and zero denotes the absence. So um, for example, species A is present in site 1.1 and is absent in 1.3. Uh, and we use this acoustic abundance data to uh, do further analysis, which I'll explain in my results section. And that would ideally uh, then guide conservation policies for better for better cropland and farming practices. And that can again be monitored by using passive acoustics again in a hopefully uh, pretty positive feedback cycle. <laughs> right. So out of the results now. First of all, my uh, study deals with the species diversity and composition in the uh, habitat. So this is a pretty uh, descriptive um, result. Uh, and we see over here that there are several generalist species that are found in both scrubland and in scrubland. And then there are some that are found only in scrubland and some that are found only in scrubland. This is not all the species, but these are some of the species that I found in my habitat. Right. So from on the basis of what we just saw right now, it's fairly easy to guess that um, there is that, that, that the scrublands would have a higher species diversity compared to croplands. And um, again, on the basis of what I showed you in the habitat, scrublands would also have a higher habitat diversity than croplands too. 
but the question is does habitat uh, diversity affect the species diversity of an area so to figure that out what we did is uh, we did a correlation test and we find that yes there is a positive correlation between habitat diversity and species diversity so it's really important to have a heterogeneous habitat to maintain a higher species diversity next as you can again guess <laughs> um scrubland and cropland uh, scrubland has a much higher spe i mean a much more diverse species composition so we find that cropland species are, are essentially a subset of scrubland species and um, this is because there are very few that are exclusively found in cropland but there are a lot more birds that are found exclusively and solely in the scrubland right so next this bring me to my uh, next section which is uh, phylogeny and morphology so while taxonomic diversity is one thing we also want to look at the functional aspect of it and so we uh, did a function we did a morphological volume uh, analysis so morphological volume basically means um, the total morphological diversity of species in a community and um, it gives you an idea of the functional diversity of how functionally rich in terms of feeding gills um, is a particular habitat and we find that again scrubland does have a higher uh, morphological volume compared to uh, cropland and um, we find that there is a correlation between habitat diversity and morphological volume it's not a very strong um, correlation but so it means that maybe habitat diversity is not the only uh, factor that leads to a high morphological volume uh, but there is definitely a correlation so to figure out what might actually lead to a higher uh, a higher morphological volume other than this we had to see what the driving uh, feeding oh sorry the driving feeding gills were in this case so to do this i i created a functional morphospecific which involved taking functional uh, sorry morphological traits of birds so i took tail length bill length uh, bird size wing length and tarsus length of the bird and i made a pca out of this <clears throat> and then we then labeled the birds according to their feeding feeding gills so i want to draw to your attention over here is the insectivore feeding gill so what you can see is a large amount of insectivores over here in the scrubland there are much fewer in cropland and this is especially significant i believe because um the number of insectivores is i mean there's an entire feeding gill that is kind of uh, dropping out with a land use change which we don't see with other feeding gills so this is most likely what is driving the difference in morphological volume for both these habitats and um, yeah it's definitely a matter of concern is that right so that's about that's that's about my results for my study and the implication of that is what is next so i found that passive acoustic monitoring was quite effective in uh, my study so it did give me a fairly high throughput of data which means that i could uh, survey 16 cropland and 18 scrubland sites Uh, with two replicates or three uh, or three replicates at times, and I got thirty days to collect sixty-eight hours of recording, and that was just me. I had no feed assistant. Uh, next, uh, in my observation, I find that it does uh, with the insectivore gill reducing with uh, the conversion to cropland. It does conform with previous survey-based studies. Um, and uh, one thing I want to point out, however, is that acoustic annotation is quite time-consuming. The presence absence matrix part of it. however uh, hopefully machine learning models that we develop might be able to change us in the future right so when it comes to diversity of heterogeneous landscapes we find that scrublands do have a higher taxonomic and a higher functional diversity and habitat heterogeneity is positively correlated to species diversity as well so monocultures are less ecologically valuable next uh, more birds which are 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 found only in scrubland compared to croplands so it's important to maintain patches of scrubland between agricultural land which is a big takeaway for me from the study at least with uh, in terms of uh, planning uh, better farmland practices uh yes uh, and uh, lastly regarding functional diversity in composition so uh, most concerningly there are fewer insectivores uh, in croplands as compared to scrubland uh so insective so therefore croplands do support a lower functional diversity compared to scrublands and it could very likely be because of certain cropland have uh, you know practices such as uh, pesticide use which was quite rampant um, in shokli at least that i would say <clears throat> and with a higher morphological volume we find that scrubland avian communities are more complex than croplands are so uh yes
this brings me to the end of my presentation and i'd like to thank my lab my pi dr anand krishnan for his constant guidance and support and help i do um, especially thank uh, dr shruti uh, datta from wii for being so helpful and for really supporting us through this entire uh, project and uh, of course the entire team of wii and the bnhs team as well uh, so yes that's uh, that's that and uh, this is the end of my presentation and uh, thank you and uh, any question would be welcome thanks antra for that fascinating talk uh, we have a couple of questions on discord karthik asks how did you test the relation between morphological volume and habitat and if you could tell us a bit more about what exactly the variable morphological volume is right thank you for the question um so morphological volume essentially it refers to um the 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 volume space occupied by the morphological traits of the bird so you take a pca basically and the and and on the three axes the the, the volume occupied by the different morphological traits and the, and the diversity of morphological traits would represent the morphological volume um i hope that answers the question and uh, i think the second one was about uh, habitat and morphological the correlation right morphological volume right. right so what i did is i uh, correlated i found a basic correlation test between the morphological volume found in a particular site and the habitat heterogeneity of that site so what is the habitat the plant diversity in that site and we found that there was a, a there was a positive correlation not necessarily very significant but there was definitely uh, an aspect of habitat heterogeneity that in that affect morphological the the morphological diversity of a particular uh, bird thanks antra prachi asks if uh, the type of crops present might affect the bird community that you recorded and is that something that you can absolutely yeah 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 so um, i mean so there's one very significant example to give which is the lesser farican so the lesser farican is um, fairly uh, it's it's quite strongly correlated with the um, type of crop so between like moong and jowar so uh and the kind of crops because because often they attract carnivorous birds the kind of grains that are will also definitely affect the composition of birds that uh, are driven by food resources thanks antra uh vrishal wonders if uh, you could share your observations on the attitude of farmers towards the birds that are found in croplands if that's something that okay can... yeah um so uh actually fortunately shoklia has a fairly um, friendly attitude towards because uh, the thing is shoklia gets a lot of i like to say our revenue from uh, bird watchers coming that that's also a, a thing so they're very friendly towards uh, people that <clears throat> you know pe pe people that come to uh, have bird surveys there is a little bit of worry about how our studies would affect their crop lands but on the whole they were fairly cooperative and quite friendly. and okay. uh, they also look at the lesser florican with a very uh, i mean they have a lot of care for the lesser florican because they see it as a part of their ecosystem so there's a lot of uh, cohesiveness over there i see okay uh, and towards the end of your uh, talk antra you were also talking uh, quite a bit about morphological volume mm -hmm. uh, i wonder if you can talk a bit about uh, the differences in phylogenetic diversity that you found between scrublands and croplands were there species oh. of certain families alone that you were recording in one type or the other right so thank you um so there is so, so uh, i mean i did find it out i have presented it over here but scrublands do have a higher phylogenetic diversity than croplands do as well and that is uh, also we we did find that was also correlated with the habitat uh, diversity so i i do believe that there is definitely a very strong correlation of um, the the plant diversity in a habitat and the kind of uh, phylogenetic diversity that of bird that it supports i see thanks again yeah, but i think you can oh sorry yeah. thank you <laughs> no sorry please please finish oh uh, no i just wanted to once more say like just drive home the point that i think you can see that very strongly in the composition of feeding gills so with uh, the whole thing where you have one feeding gill of of insectivores that's reducing i think that i think uh, drives home the point about cropland and, and uh, you know like the, the practices that are being used in cropland areas and that is exactly how that's probably affecting the uh, phylogenetic diversity and the morphological diversity thanks thanks thank you and yeah thanks again for a wonderful talk uh next up we have uh, soyar savant who finished his masters from isa tirupati and he'll be talking to us about uh, his talk is titled can we monitor individual birds using acoustics a case study of the white bellied sholakili uh hello everyone uh 
Uh, I'm Suyash, and today I'll be presenting about our research, recent research on uh, white billed Shola Kelly, where we looked at if we can actually track individuals using passive acoustics. So, so far we have had very interesting talks in the fields of ecology and conservation, and I think this talk will be more about like uh, if we can learn more about the bird behavior and using some new technology in passive acoustic model. So, we all know about how fascinating bird vocalizations are. And uh, every species uses different kind of vocalization, which have different behavioral conflict, context. But specifically, what we, I will be talking about is bird song, which play a very important role in mate selection, territorial defense, and has a significant role in reproductive fitness of a bird. So studying this uh, song or song complexity has been of uh, interest to many people, or many researchers over the years. And it tells us a lot about uh, the ecology of bird or many behavioral fish. Uh, so, uh, going further, talking about this study species here, white billed shola. Kelly. It's an uh, endemic bird to the shola skylands or mountain tops of southern western Ghats in India. Uh, it's a monomorphic bird, as you can see here. Both male and female look. Uh, it's are very difficult to distinguish in field. Uh, but uh, interestingly, they have like a very interesting vocalization. So, as you see on the right side, there are spectrograms of whistles, alarm calls. And the songs, what we see here is a male song. Females also do sing, but today we will be uh, more concerning about the male song aspect as it is more common. So as you can see here, it's uh, kind of a complex in terms of like it's made up of this small uh, note, uh, small, small sections called notes. And they vary a lot in the spectrotemporal uh, shape of this, or the structure. Uh, going next, where do we find this bird? I think most of you may already know. It's, uh, uh, we found it in the... Palni and Namala Hills, uh, must be and above around 1,400 meters. But uh, today, I will, uh, this particular study is mainly focused on one small Shola forest patch uh, called Bombay Shola in Kodai Canal. Uh, so the birds are, uh, the white billed Shola can be very uh, territorial uh, and they sing very complex song, especially during the breeding season. Uh, going next to the song of Shola Kali. So actually, our recent study where we looked at like songs of multiple, uh, like a bird species across the globe, which people say that, oh, these are very highly complex birds. So we compare and it found out that the Sholakali is like one of the most complex song birds. Uh, so uh, like you can, as you can see on the right side is a, a repertoire size estimation, the vocal repertoire size in terms of notes. It has like every individual almost has more than 150 notes. And you can just imagine the permutation and combinations possible to create one song. So it's just songs are so dynamic and that makes it more interesting. As well as within songs also, we find it very complex in terms of different uh, frequency levels which it sings within a song. Uh, and just to relate, we have a spectrogram of song and what kind of parameters we generally look at. Or a song is kind of, you can write it in terms of like A, B, C, D, D, F, F, G, H, H, etc. Like, in terms of how these notes are, the way how they are arranged within a song. Uh, so going next uh, to white billed Shola Kelly, and one interesting aspect is the dialects and individual signature. So uh, as I mentioned before, these birds are endemic uh, to this Shola, mainly to the Shola forest, which is like a uh, mosaic of grassland and forest. And we have these small patches where the bird uh, generally occur. And as you can see here, like if you have like this uh, patches separated from each other, so we say there are th maybe three different populations. Uh, and each population, uh, there are multiple individuals which sing. Uh, no, what uh, ideally we expect or based on the previous literature, we, we see that like uh, these birds may have like uh, dialects, which are basically, as you can see in the first population, uh, we see every individual is like a three representative song and you can see there is like X, Y, Z, Z is common within two individuals. Next next population, we have the A, B, C common, which basically means that they, they do sing, but there is a pattern within their song and some of the sequences of notes are repeated across individuals. So that creates the dialects uh, across population now coming. Now what happens within one population? Let's take an example of the second population. Now you see that, okay, there is this A, B, C maintained across individuals. But more than that, again, for every individual, we might find like some sequences repeated across the uh, different song they sing, say, throughout the day, throughout the year. So that's what makes it interesting. Like, say, the first individual has like A, B, C, D, D occurring like, so it need not to occur every time, but it occurs many of the time when it sings. 
same with another individual where you might have like a multiple signatures this a b c and d e d e so the signatures could tell much more about about like how often do they sing it or how many uh, such signature exist for individual and that's what we are trying to understand in this study so uh, uh, like there have been a, a some literature pre- previous literature around this individual signatures and vocal dialect mostly focus in the western countries uh, one of the classical example is uh, king sparrows where they look at like how uh, every individual have a different kind of uh, songs and how do they relate to their neighbors and you can see they have represented nicely in the spectrograms and uh, they compare like how the neighbors or the individuals far from each other have different kind of songs another recent study uh, on savannah sparrows where they look at dialects across this uh, uh, two or three islands and they actually use passive acoustic uh, recorders to uh, like an array of passive acoustic recorders across the island to actually see if they can uh, find like a uh, different dialects or birds within this particular region seem to be singing certain type of song or only and uh, we can see it represented here so going next uh, back to our uh, our research topic which is the white billed solakri so yeah as i mentioned before this is a monomorphic species and it's very difficult to segregate them on field so first thing is to do is we need to know individual identity if we want to really study the songs of this individual so for that we uh, color band is individuals you can see there are four pictures here with different color rings on their feet which are uh, which help us to understand which uh, like each individual separately when we do field observation and uh, we have been ringing this bird in the bombay shola pass since 2018 and so far we have around 48 50 birds um, so these rings are generally combination of one to four colors and every time we go uh, in the field observe the birds or record the songs of the bird it, uh, it also help us to know which bird it is as well as we use molecular sexing techniques to know uh, if it's a male or female so since we have already uh, this bird ring Uh, it's easy for us to actually go track their movement where all we find each individual and do like a visual observations so as you can see here like we just multiple people in our group have been going out taking observation the gps locations every time they see a coloring individual and what we do is like once we have like a significant number of uh, p- uh, points for each individual we can build up some these polygons which kind of tells us the territories of this individual um now yeah like this may not be very robust but they give, will give us some idea about like how far this individual move and what are the territories look like the uh, shape and size of this territory uh, now talking about territories we have been monitoring this bird since almost 2019 2021 22 i have represented in three of the years because 20 20 data was lost uh, uh, we couldn't get much data because of covid but as you can see here we have more than 25 males that we have been monitoring across this 3 4 years we are currently also monitoring for the 2023 season uh, now many of the individuals seems to have like consistency in their territory locations but there is a uh, little change and uh, it actually help us uh, to track uh, or uh, go next year and find where the individuals are so we can record after it now we already know that okay where we find is individual next thing is to go and record the song so yeah though we are mainly focusing here about passive acoustic monitoring to know which individual sings what it's important for us to take targeted recordings uh, since when we record we know what uh, individual it is and we can assign all the different parameters to that particular individual so so far we have analyzed around 35000 songs across 12, 12 uh, breeding men this is across three four seasons and we, we use this shotgun microphone on the field record uh, each individual separately and uh then uh, use uh, raven pro software and wabler r package in r to analyze the data uh, we use something called spectrum cross correlation for classifying this notes as i was mentioning before which basically every song uh, can be converted into a sequence of say a b c d d e e f kind of like or you can see here example clearly uh, we compare uh, each uh, note with each other at the spectrum level and then run hierarchical clustering that give us like a classified output uh, automated classified out now once we have the sequences of the songs in terms of some letters which are easy to quantify uh, the next thing is to look at like uh, how there are this repetition of certain sequences or which sequences occur more or consistently consistent in variation in this uh, songs across say seasons or years uh, which can answer different questions for us 
So for that, we use a particular approach called in graphs approach, which is uh, very commonly used in uh, human linguistics. So just to quickly explain what it is about is say we have the spectrogram uh, of a song on the top and these notes are classified as A, A, B, C, D. Now, in that case, every note can be written as a separate unit or it can be written as a group of two like A, 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 B, B, C or a group of three, group of four, group of five, etc. So we can actually see at what level do we see uh, like uh, the individual signatures like Two individuals may know A, B, C separately, but one uses it as A, B, C, and other one uses it C, A, B, uh, etc. So this will help us to actually look at like how this uh, structure or the syntax of the song vary across individuals. So for that, we what we did is uh, we looked at uh, so what we see here is a twelve individuals uh, from a single season data, uh, and you see uh, there are this unigrams, bigrams, and trigrams. Basically, the uh, sequences of length one, two, and three which are represented here, and shared and individual specific. Basically, shared are uh, those kind of uh, n-grams which are common across two individuals versus individual specific, like only one particular individual uses uh, that uh, kind of sequence in their whole song. And that is what we, are, what we are interested in because that will give us the individual identity when we trace back it from the passive acoustic data. So another uh, way to look at it uh, here is a uh, NMDS plots, and you can see on the plot on the background we have put all the n-grams for uh, uh, recorded from this all twelve individuals, and we see how uh, this individuals are placed based on the sharing and how much proportion of their uh, uh, this n-grams are individual specific. So okay, now we already have classified the notes, we got the n-grams, and now we want to look at the individual signatures. Now, every individual can have multiple signatures, as I mentioned before. But uh, say, taking example of this one particular individual, and say we found that this individual has A, B, C, D, E, and H, I, which are two signatures which often occur. Uh, so there would be signatures which occur like one or one or twice, but I think uh, which occur more number of times uh, would be a better uh, template for us to when we look at the passive data, since we would be able to find more such instances. So uh, I think we have uh, some of uh, the researchers already discussed about different approaches in uh, the passive acoustic data and the detection work. So what uh, we will be doing here is take these uh, signatures as templates and then run it over the whole data, say whole month of data, whole year of data, and it will give us uh, uh, the matches wherever it, uh, the, the one particular individual is singing because these are individual specific signatures, uh, and which is what we are uh, shown here in the spectrum at the bottom. Uh, so uh, this is ideally would work well on paper, but uh, we are still in the process on doing this thing and uh, stay tuned for the output of it. Now, uh, so far what we have done is we have placed around like four to five recorders across this Bombay Shola population and two of the recorders have run like more than a year. We use this uh, wildlife acoustics SM4 recorders. Uh, and uh, right now, one of my uh, colleague is working on extracting one single individual's data from a rec recorder since it is placed in the center of a territory, and if we can ex uh, use the individual signatures uh, to monitor its uh, phenology as well as the diurnal pattern. Now, going forward in the future, the first thing uh, we are planning to do is if we can have uh, different recorders placed at the center of, say, every territory, so that will help us to have gather much larger data using passive acoustics. Uh, uh, which is kind of not possible if we are uh, going every time and targeted recording, which is the limitation. Uh, now, second thing uh, uh, is possible is in terms of using the sound localization, individual signatures uh, using the ARU data that can actually give us uh, like say individual movement uh, within that area. So uh, there are multiple challenges uh, in this thing, like having uh, uh, the precision of uh, detecting such calls as well as the detection location using multi-channel recorders. Uh, this is going to be a, uh, this would be a great uh, way of uh, collecting data uh, com using completely passive acoustic rec recorders in the future and stay tuned uh, for more output from it. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, everyone at EcoEvo Lab uh, and also for the level of Anupati, Kodi Connection School, uh, Tamil Nadu Forest Department, Asa Tirupati, and field assistance. Thank you. Thanks, Soyash, for a wonderful talk. It's it's an amazing example of uh, showing what you can do with just doing targeted research 
with a single species in mind and a small geographic region and we have so much to learn about its uh, uh, vocal communication and, and its bioacoustics. Uh, while questions pour in on Discord, I have a question. Uh, did you observe if there was uh, any correlation between the dialects of these different individuals and the geographic distance between them? Did you, did you see that uh, the farthest individuals had the most distinct dialects? Uh, yeah, interesting question. So, uh, like going like before going to passive acoustics, that that was our first question is like, how much variation do we find within a population? Because yeah, of course, uh, previous study has shown across population, there uh, the there the songs are very different uh, across these populations. But yeah, so uh, though we have like a limited sample size, like uh, so all the studies I think be based within like. I think one kilometer of uh, area. So though like we see that there seem to be that like the near individuals or the neighboring individuals seems to have uh, very similar uh, songs or they use certain engrams which are common between them versus uh, individual that is further or a stranger individual. But uh, to conclude anything, I think I would say we would need uh, like a more a number of years of data as well as if we can monitor uh, say the offsprings of each individuals, uh, how far do they disperse and if we find again uh, the real Like the similarity between their songs, so it's like always going to be like parent of of and neighbors, non neighbors. So these are the two levels we are looking at. There. Fascinating, yeah. I, I'm I'm also wondering if uh, you know, given that you have data across seasons, right? Uh, right. Are you noticing that uh, the the repetition of these engrams or the structure or order of these engrams have they been changing for different individuals across years? Uh, yeah. So interesting again. So. Uh, right so far like right now uh, i'm again uh, like recording data for this year so we will be like, having like a five years of data in total and uh, i haven't completed the whole analysis we are still in the process so but so far what we have understood that there seems to be a consistency like for each individual some uh, types of engrams or some syllables like some syntax is consistent across the years whether uh, while some other parts uh, where some sequences are lost from one year to other and also like added to the next year so uh, i think eventually we'll get to like what's the proportion of such things which are lost which are consistent and which are added every year got it thanks uh karthik asks if uh, if there's any sort of a significant threshold to classify a sequence of repeated notes as an individual signature uh, and he also adds that because not only does it have to be very frequent in that bird's vocalization, but it also has to be equally infrequent in other birds as well. Sure, sure. So uh, I think I'll start from the second part of the question. So, so far what we have looked at uh, is the complete exclusion. So if uh, even uh, the sequence occurs once or twice in another individual, we don't consider it as a signature for the individual A. So, so to make sure that, okay, because uh, everything is kind of uh, subjective about how much data we already have. So uh, for the first time we recorded, we recorded around 300 songs per individual. And then we got uh, that threshold, okay, 150 songs would be enough for us to actually get to that saturation for each individual. Now, again, uh, we might say some sequences may not not be represented for one individual. So that's, that is always going to be there since the bird has such uh, dynamic songs. Uh, but yeah, like, so we are already excluded even they have appeared once, but coming to the first part, like how many times do, does it have to occur to call it uh, individual signature? Uh, I'm not sure we have a perfect answer for that thing because um, say uh, within a one year, uh, like for first year, the individual sang it only two or three times. Uh, and we might have included it in our uh, analysis. Now, the next is we would, it might have used that particular signature much, uh, many more times or very often. So I think at this point, I can't really uh, give a conclusion on that thing. But yeah, like, stay tuned. Maybe we'll have that out. Too, so. Thanks again, Suryash, for this. Yeah. Uh, there are some more questions on Discord. But for okay. the sake of time, we'll have to move to the next speaker. Thanks uh, a lot, Vijay. Next up, we have... Uh, Swayam Thakur. Swayam will be talking to us about automated passive acoustic monitoring of the critically endangered lesser florican. Hello, everyone. 
my name is swayam thakkar and i am a final year computer science engineering student at the mit world peace university pune i am currently doing my internship at the wildlife institute of india under the bustard recovery program today i'll be talking on automating passive acoustic monitoring on lesser florigens let's start with why automate at all the traditional passive acoustic monitoring involves installing multiple field recorders in a desired landscape to collect acoustic data of its surroundings the data is then processed to extract valuable information on the species richness and diversity for that landscape however the bottleneck in analyzing bioacoustic data lies in its pre-processing step going through hours and hours of these field recordings to identify the occurrence of a bird call is highly tiresome and labor heavy due to this getting inference from the collected data takes months or even years this in turn reduces the frequency of field surveys on introducing automation to this process the time taken between data collection and data pre-processing reduces drastically to give an idea where a human can annotate a 15 minute audio in 7 to 8 minutes an automated system takes less than a minute this also reduces human efforts and more iterations of the survey can be performed on field but there are some prerequisites for a critically endangered species like lesser florican the precision of the deep learning model in detecting calls is the most important factor to keep in mind with that the entire automated system should be reliable and user friendly so before going to the techniques and implementation let's have a look at the bird during breeding season the male florigens jump up to 2 to 3 meters and create a sonation from their wing feathers with sound something like this the sudden bursts of energy in the waveform and spectrogram act as a signature for the bird call and this pattern remains constant this information is used to train an artificial intelligence model which can classify between the presence and absence of a pattern in any audio clip the slides ahead show a proof of concept and the implementation of a species specific audio classification model the entire workflow of the process would look something like this we start by importing the complete audio file it was observed that the call duration for a lesser florican is between 0.5 to 0.8 seconds so the raw files are cut into chunks of 1 seconds these chunks are then converted into the respective spectrogram images these images are passed to a pre-trained classification model and the predictions are in the forms of in the form of ones and zeros giving the presence and absence of lesser florican in a clip The predictions can then be exported with their respective timestamps in an excel sheet. The next step is what makes this model even more beautiful. Once validated by a human, these new results can be given to the model as new training data for continuous refinement. But before doing any of this, we need to train a first level deep learning model. For this, a good training data is required. 28 hours of field recordings collected from Ajmer Rajasthan was used as a raw training data these audio clips were annotated using raven like software provided by the cornell lab of ornithology using the selection tables obtained from the software these field recordings were cut into 1 second windows and segregated into two folders namely lesser florican calls and background noise these two folders combined is what we name as our master dataset There is just one last step remaining before this data can be given to a neural network for training, and that is data processing. A computer can understand data only in the form of numbers, so giving audio clips was not an option. So in method one, the audio clips from the master dataset was converted into their respective spectrogram images. These spectrograms are generated by performing short time Fourier transform on the audio files. the x axis represents time y axis represents frequency which here lies between 0 to 12 kilohertz and the color represents the magnitude of amplitude or a frequency for a particular instance in time darker the color means higher the amplitude after converting all the audio clips into their spectrograms the final process dataset was created in the second approach 
knowing that the lesser florican coil lies between 1.5 to 3.5 kilohertz in frequency a high pass and low pass filter was applied to the audio clips and spectrogram images for only the required frequency band were generated to create the process data set now that the data sets are ready let's see how exactly a model gets trained after annotating 28 hours of recordings we found more than 800 lesser florican calls and the rest of the clips were named as background noise the data set was first divided into training and testing subsets in 80% and 20% ratios respectively the training data is then fed to a convolutional neural network which has multiple interconnected neurons mimicking a human brain the learning happens in multiple iterations and the model gets better and better by working on the errors it made in the previous iterations finally the weights assigned to each class in the training data is what we know as the final trained model this model was then tested on the remaining 20% data which was not seen by the model during training different evaluation metrics like accuracy precision recall f1 score etc are used to evaluate the performance of the model for the two process data sets created earlier let's have a look at the results on the test data this data had more than 200 lesser florican calls and around 10000 background noises as we see both model 1 and 2 have similar learning curves but model 2's curves are slightly smoother showing a gradual learning process f1 score which is nothing but a harmonic mean of precision and recall was used to evaluate class wise performance of the model we see that just by applying a frequency filter the f1 score increased from 91% in model 1 to 95% in model 2 this shows that the better we process the data before giving it to a model the easier it will be for the model to learn distinct class features but we have barely scratched the surface at the moment currently our model is trained only on spectrogram images but there is a possibility to use raw numerical data of each signal for model training different preprocessing techniques like image augmentation can be used to generate a more generic data set Our model is yet to be tested on out of sample data so the generality of it is yet to be tested with recent advances and continuous improvements in deep learning models this technique can be continuously refined with new architectures coming every day plus there is a scope of combining this model with the existing global or regional models like the birdnet or merlin sound id finally we can use the same technique to create species specific model for different species thank you so much for listening to me and the stage is now open for questions thanks vayam for a very interesting talk on you know using deep learning approaches to detect this critically endangered species while we wait for questions to pour in on discord uh, i had a very basic question uh, as an ecologist sometimes when i you know learn more about these neural networks i find them as black boxes so can you tell us a bit more about how these neural networks work uh yeah sure uh, am i audible can you just confirm yeah we can hear you great uh so i'll start with what we have used currently in the models that we are training so in convolutional neural networks the model basically tries to learn features which are specific to a particular class so let's say you have five images of a dog and five images of a cat and when you give it to the model you don't tell that what features define a cat and a dog but the model goes through each and every pixel of the images provided to different classes and the features as simple as straight line curves or horizontal lines when they are combined together they form the weights for that class so let's say how we learn like if we see a dog once and if we see a dog twice we try to memorize the features which are similar in both the images that we saw so in that same manner when a model sees multiple images of different classes together and differently it tries to combine and differentiate the features and that's how the weights are defined for each class and then that entire mesh of uh, features are then uh, you know matched on the new images that we give for testing and the ones that match the most are classified accordingly 
I see. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, so when you are describing, you know, creating this neural network, I think you were talking to us about the training data, and you had all of this signal, which were calls that were coming from the lesser florican, but you also had a lot of background noise. Can you tell us why you required so much background noise to train your model? Uh, uh, let's put it this way. Uh, this model we are building uh, for a specific species, right? So we want to train the model in such a way that it should not miss any of the lesser florican calls. In, even though it, like for example, in a clip of 15 minutes, let's say we have five lesser florican calls, actually, the model can go overboard and tell us that there are 10 calls. That will be better. But it can't say that it has only three calls because that will be a big loss. So training the model for background noise was more important because it should know that what an actual background noise is. And even though if it is not possible to, it is not possible to, you know, train the model for all kinds of background noises, but the maximum that we are able to give, it will be better. Got it. Thanks again. Thanks so much, Swayam. Uh, for the sake of time, we'll have to wrap up the session, but there are some more questions on uh, Discord, which you can tackle later. Uh, sure. So that brings us an end to uh, both the mini symposia related to passive acoustic monitoring. I once again wanted to thank all the speakers who contributed their time and research to present uh, their findings and uh, tell us more about uh, how acoustics is being used for bird monitoring. A couple of other announcements before we break for lunch. If you joined late and missed some of these talks, you can still view them on YouTube and you can continue to post questions for speakers on the Discord thread. We will now break for lunch and meet again at 2 p.m. for the poster session. The entire poster session will happen in, in the 24th March posters channel on Discord. And all poster presenters will be available from 2 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. to answer your questions. Please note that the poster session is entirely on Discord. And lastly, we'll meet again at 4 p.m. for the keynote lecture, which will be delivered by Dr. Laurel Symes, and the link will be posted on the appropriate channel. So see you all soon, and uh, have a great lunch.